Yeah, for purposes of the record and the remote record, uh, it's Monday, November 8th. Um, it's 8.37 and the board is convened to consider its first uh, of several elevator cases this morning. The first case is uh, we'll set for 8.30 is case number 21-0126 and it deals um, with an elevator adjudication uh, dealing with at 122 Park Avenue in Shockton and the divisions the elevator division's adjudication numbers noted on our docket. Let's have an introduction of the parties. Um, we don't believe the appellant uh, or appellant representative, Mr. Holder, is here, but if you are Mr. Holder, uh, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Okay, as, uh, as suspected, he is not present. Um, Mr. Updike, if you are present, would you enter your appearance, please? Charles Updike, Chief Elevator Inspector for the State of Ohio. Fair enough. Um, Chip, if you would stand and raise your right hand, Tammy, would you administer the oath? Yes. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, I'm, I, I can start off. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming Susan fed you with some information, just some historical background on these type of lists, but I can start off with the uh, request for variance and I'll just read it aloud so that we're all on the same page. Um, current requirements for the A17-1, um, per, per the A17-1 2016 code section 86410 require hoist ropes to be re-socketed every year for cars roped one to one and located over the hoist way and every two years for machines located below or beside the hoist way. The current installation of a Lula and or a vertical platform lift cannot be resocketed due to manufacturer constraints and require a complete replacement of the ropes. And so instead of socketing, they must be re replaced. These lifts are limited in use and limited in access and they're located in <clears throat> in locations such as churches and low low use, low profile, low capacity. The proposed request is replaced ropes every five years versus the current A17-1 requirements of every one year or two years. Hoist ropes have been replaced on a five-year interval multiple times and have never revealed any wire breaks or damages. And I have no objections with the only condition is to tag the rope accordingly as when the last uh, replacement was done. Any questions? Questions, Mr. Updike? Yeah, Chip, does, would it make sense to put this as, as a condition that's noted on the uh, certificate of operation for this elevator? Um, the, I'm not sure what you mean, but these are all existing elevators. There's no more new installs like this going in. So, you mean as far as the condition on the certificate? Um, I'm just wondering if it's worth just making an extra paper trail to this, that it's it's a special condition that gets listed on the certificate. I, I don't know that we have. Well, I've never seen that done on our certificate of operations, but I definitely could uh, could ask about that, yes. Yeah, again, it's, it's more uh, a request, you know, of something maybe for your division or maybe maybe it doesn't matter maybe this is something that that comes up every single time that the inspector goes out there he automatically knows this versus it something is, that needs to be noted on there it, it it is it's an obvious thing it's something we've been dealing with for close to 30 years it's in the permanent record on all of these lifts so when inspectors show up they know exactly what they're looking at it's an automatic give me on winding drums is to verify the shackling points and see if whether or not they need to be replaced one, two, or possibly five years in this case. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. This variance is just for this one location and uh, one, two, that, two, that is that is correct, and I'm anticipating potentially 1,200 other locations requesting the same variance. How many did you say? 1,200. 1,200? 
Yeah, I have five waiting in the wings now. I've been kind of pushing them off just to see what how this first hearing would go before I had them pursue the whole go through the whole process. If you've got a, a nice way to expedite these, I'm more than welcome to have that suggestion or that conversation on a side note if we need to. I think to answer that, can we do a consent agenda? I don't know. We've done before. Didn't take you used to do those? Yeah, I think that's possible, and, and then maybe that's why I was also considering. Maybe there's the a standard condition that we 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 put on there to help help that process. I guess I'm okay with the variance if the chief elevator inspector is. I are the chip. How do these get in front of us in a jurisdictional way? I mean. If they're in front of us now, then we do a consent. If they're not, can't consent to the future, right? No, 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 not 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 for the the future cases. But I mean, this case we can do it. But I, I think it's worthwhile taking the time to think about, yeah, what might happen with future cases. Uh, Chip, would, are, is that five year going to be something that's going to be standard or is that going to be like a case by case basis? It'll be a standard. It's been a standard for years. Yes. How'd you come up with five years? Uh, that was prior to me 22 years ago when I started the state. That was a requirement that uh, previous uh, administrations had made and a previous chief had made. And I, I, I've questioned this over the years past, not because I've had concerns with it, it's just how other states were doing it. And I, I actually called out, reached out to a couple states last week, and they're like, yeah, we, these are all light duty lists. Some, some states don't even require replacement to all, just inspections. Uh, are cables normally needed to be replaced on elevators like this? Uh, Heavy freight elevators with winding drums, yes. What happens is as that drum unwinds and rewinds, that cable moves back and forth and there may be a little bit of twist and at that shackle point, it gets weak. And that's where they normally breaks, where this is not the case here, where the, the, the traditional freight elevator winding drums, those drums can be anywhere from two feet to four feet wide. So you get a lot of sway on the ropes, these Lula lifts, they're six to 12 inches at the, at the most long. So you don't get a lot of sway in the rope. And again, it's it's the amount of use and capacity that just that just takes them out of the neighborhood of the larger freight elevators. I mean, the code require changing of cables? They require the reshackling of the cables. Okay. And that's that point there. So they'll unhook it here and they'll pull out some more rope in the drum and reshackle it at that point. Shackling is just the connection between the cable and the elevator. Correct. So how long would this conceivably go on? I mean, at what point do you say this is old enough that the whole cabling and shackle mechanism needs to be replaced? Uh, well, for the life of the unit, if, that, if, I, if I'm understanding your question. Well, I mean, is there, does there come a point in time where you say we're not comfortable with just a visual inspection? This needs to be replaced. Well, and that's what this variance is. We are we are we are comfortable with a five year increment. So in five years, you will replace these ropes versus okay. attempting to reshackle one or two years because you can't reshackle these. These are a pressed on fitting and you can't unhook it and re, re, reattach it. All right. It's fitting you know from the manufacturer their special order ropes you call the manufacturer they put the swage fitting on there for you and cut it to length and you wrap it around the drum okay sorry i misunderstood how yeah. often are these inspected just as an uh, ordinary course of business every nine every nine months on time frame okay how many inspectors do you have uh, we got 60 QEI certified inspectors right now. If I could, Mr. Chair, let me read out a condition that I think I think is probably worthwhile doing. 
as I know it's part of the procedural um, things that the elevator inspector section does, but I think if we put it as a condition on there, I think it's a little bit extra weight. So uh, variance of the condition upon replacing the ho hoist ropes at five uh, parent numeral five and parent year intervals to the satisfaction of the elevator inspector. That five year interval. Does it have a starting point? And I think that's to this. That's why I put to the satisfaction of the elevator inspector. Yeah. We're not going to hit all. They're not all on the exact same five right. years. And again, this is just looking at down down the future. Chip, you got any comments on that? No, um, the elevator service providers do a annual an, a test on these, so they 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 put these to test. They test the safety. They inspect the ropes very thoroughly, and then every five years they load these cars with weights and drop them. And that tested. So the five year test with weights is the time when they also replace the ropes because the elevator's down for a long period of time. So they replace the ropes, they do a five year test with weights and it's back in service. And then we'll see in five years from now and do the same thing over again. So the customer tries to put the replacement at the same time as the five year test. It just makes it more more uh, convenient to the customer. But the, but the, but the condition that Paul read. Yes, that five year interval to the satisfaction of you. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. That works well. They, they tag them. I think, don't they? I was thinking they tag the elevators for the day when they do this stuff. Yes, that is already a requirement in the A171 that. You tag it on the date of the new installation of ropes, so that's already a requirement in there. It's just we pay more particular close attention on these lifts with winding drums that are required to replace one, two, and now possibly five years. So we pay real close attention to those to make sure they're doing them in the right uh, interval. Okay. In this elevator, how many people can ride on it at one time? Uh, Lula's they range anywhere from 500 to 1400 pounds, so <laughs> one to three at the most. And this is basically like a two story. Yeah, they're limited in rise. I think the maximum we have out there without variances is 21 feet. What do you say? 21 feet. Oh, 21 feet. Yeah. Okay, um, you need to read that again. Uh, no, I, I will just okay. for uh, the yeah. record. Variance is conditioned upon replacing the hoist ropes at five parent numeral five and parent year intervals to the satisfaction of the elevator inspector. Okay, and again, Mr. Updike, that's fine with you, correct? As framed? Yes, it is. Thank you. I would entertain a motion. Yes, Mr. Chair, for Board of Building Appeals, case number 21-0126, the appellant is Timothy Holder for the premises uh, church located at 122 Park Avenue, Coshocton, Ohio, 43812. The appellee is Charles Updike, Chief Elevator Inspector for the State of Ohio, and adjudication order number E-2021-28282. Uh, I move to grant the variance subject to the condition previously read in the record and no even no objections of the Chief Elevator Inspector. OK, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. All sure. those in favor say aye. Uh, Any aye. opposed? OK, variance is granted uh, on that condition unanimously by the board. That'll move us in then to the next elevator case, which is case number 21-0128. Uh, uh, and it deals with uh, American Electric Power's uh, Cardinal plant located in Brilliant, Ohio, and the division's uh, adjudication uh, order number is noted on the docket. Uh, let's have an introduction to the parties. Uh, first, beginning with the appellant and or appellant's representative. I understand Mr. Hillmar may be present. Not sure about Mr. Carruthers, uh, and we know Mr. Updike is present. Go ahead, Mr. Hillmar. Yeah. Uh, name is Christian Hillmar, and last name is spelled H I L. M is in Michael A R. Okay, and is Mr. Carruthers attending as well? Uh, he will not be. No. 
Mr. Updike, would you enter your appearance, please? Charles Updike, Chief Elevator Inspector for the state of Ohio. OK, and if the both of you would stand wherever you're uh, situated, raise your right hand. Tammy, would you administer the oath? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll you guys? Yes, I do. I, I do. OK, uh, fair enough. Obviously, this is an appeal, so Mr. Hillmar, if you want to present, that's fine. If you want to defer to uh, the, the uh, elevator chief, you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I can. Uh, so, uh, so the elevator that we're that's going at the uh, AP of as the acronym AP, the Cardinal Unit Three plant. Um, uh, the elevator is rated for a capacity of uh, it's a rack and pinion elevator rated for a capacity of thirty one hundred kilograms or six thousand eight hundred and thirty four pounds. Um, it's replacing an elevator that. Uh, uh, is no longer in service. Um, and discussing it with uh, Charles, uh, we think the best route for this elevator, it, well, because of its capacity, it gets pushed into elevator uh, A17.1 section 4.1. Um, but uh, uh, speaking with Charles on this, um, we think it's best to classify this as a special purpose elevator. Uh, in accordance with section 5.7. Uh, the limitation here is that an elevator that is in accordance with section 5.7 uh, can have a capacity that is of no more than a thousand pounds and a platform area of no more than 13 square feet. Uh, again, the current elevator that will be going there has a capacity of 6,834 pounds and in a uh, a area of 61 square feet. Um, the 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 code dictates that per in order to be classified as a special purpose elevator that the loading shall be at least uh, 70 uh, pounds per square foot. And our elevator is just bear with me really quick. Our elevator is rated for um, 112 pounds per square foot. So we exceed that uh, requirement. Uh, Charles and I feel that this is a, a appropriate route to go because um, this elevator is not accessible to the public. It's only by trained plant personnel um, and with special purpose it can be used for uh, you can be ridden by just a passenger or it can be plant personnel and any tools or anything that fit within the capacity of the elevator. OK, questions of Mr. Hillmar. What does classifying it as a special service elevator get you? I'm not intimately familiar with the elevator code. So classifying it is Special purpose, I think, I, I don't know the history entirely, but typically special purpose elevators, um, they're, they're used in, in power plant type applications where, um, you know, uh, well, the two buckets typically is, you know, there's passenger and then there's freight and there's limitations of both. Um, with passenger elevators, you can't carry any freight whatsoever. With, uh, with freight elevators, um, it can only be the the freight that they're moving plus the rider, um, the elevator. You know, you can't have multiple people use it as a passenger elevator. I think special purpose was developed just so it kind of gives a little bit of that flexibility in an industrial setting, um, and that's the and that's how this elevator uh, will be used. And I believe also to the the elevator that it is replacing was also uh, classified as uh, special purpose. So it's not any safety or inspection issue. It's just a matter that you're going to carry freight and passenger. That's correct. Yep. Yep. It's the this meets all other requirements. Okay. Any other questions of the uh, appellant representative? I have a question for Chip Upton. All right. Go ahead, Chip. Why is there a, a one thousand pound capacity for special purpose? Why, why is why is that? 
I don't really know, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, they're typically small cars that go up through smoke stacks or on the side of buildings and they're one or two people and they don't allow tools. Um, they're most always, at least the higher rise uh, units are always rack and pinion and they're pretty much pretty much limitless on the height, height, that, height that they can go. The size, I don't know because code allows rack and pinion elevators to go as, as large a capacity as they want and, and pretty much do whatever they want as far as a as a freight elevator as far as rack and pinion. And this could segue onto Chip's question, what is the difference between um, this rack and pinion special purpose elevator and a rack and pinion um, passenger or freight elevator? And the biggest difference is there's no fire service there's no smoke detector requirements. There's no pit requirements. There's no overhead requirements. There's no fire rating requirements, and that's perfect for this type of application. This install would look very, very similar to a buck hoist on a new construction site. Exactly almost like it. Obviously more robust and built to be there on a permanent basis. Those more like an elevator used on a construction site? Yes, it, like a buck hoist is what they refer to it, yes. Okay, I guess we didn't hear officially what your comfort level is. We could presume that, but uh, are you comfortable with the granting of the variance? Oh, yes, no objections or conditions. <clears throat> Any other questions of either Mr. Holmar or Mr. Updike at this point in time? Everybody in favor of the variance? Yeah. Uh, um, I would entertain a motion. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, for Board of Building Appeals case number 21-0128. The appellant is Michael Carruthers uh, for the Buckeye Power at premises AEP Carbon Plant 306 uh, County Road 7E in Brilliant, Ohio 43913. The appellee is Charles Updike, Chief Elevator Inspector for the State of Ohio and adjudication order number E2021-67561. Uh, I move to grant the variance uh, to designate this elevator as a special purpose elevator uh, uh, without condition, uh, noting the no objection of the chief elevator inspector. Okay, before I entertain a second, uh, Mr. Updike, Mr. Hillmore, that was properly stated, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, I would entertain a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, a variance is granted without condition. Thank you very much, Mr. Hillmar. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thank you, Chip. Well, I originally thought I couldn't get out of it, but just let me appear by phone. Christine, are you present? Yeah, let's find out who's here for now. I am. Okay, I thought that was you calling in. Um, Thank you. You know who else we should expect for your case? Um, that's why I'm here. It'll just be me today. It's just you? Yeah. I was not aware you were to be invited. I have, um, <laughs> let's see here. Chris, Chris Koval, yeah. which he emailed me wanting to test at like 8 a.m. this morning. So he will not be present or Dan Hall. Um, are those the building official side? No. Uh, which case are you? You said 210136. This is a uh, Liberty. Liberty. Um, sorry, Elevate Office Week. Liberty I'm sorry. Center. Elevate Office Week, Liberty Center. Is that the Butler County one? Yeah. No, that's not that's not scheduled for today. I'm sorry, you sent, sent me, me you sent me something for, did I send you the wrong notice? Hang on. Let's see, you sent back twenty one zero one three six. That's why I was confused because you weren't a party to it. Originally, this is a uh, board of building oh, stand. You know what? Yeah, you sent me a meeting notice and it had the wrong information on it. 
And I sent it back, and then you sent me the new one. The date was um, on October 7th. It's not scheduled for today. If it's a different case, correct, out of Butler County? Yeah. I can look and see what I've sent. A moment. It's CBA case number 21-0100. Yeah, I don't have my other agenda with me, but I think you're so scheduled to be on. Yeah, it was November 3rd, and the date of the hearing was October 7th at 1 a.m. No, hang on a second. You said one, okay. one, three, one. Yeah, 21. All, all I show being sent on 11-3 was an acknowledgement letter, which gave you a date, and I'm pulling it up now, of... Of October 7th, oh, that's weird, um, and then postpones it. So you have, I don't see sending you the yeah, notice. The other one was just sent to me by mistake then? Okay. Uh, evidently, yeah, I'm, it's, I'm pulling it up. This is uh, strange, maybe it's a mix up. Yes, I apologize, I sent it to the wrong Chris. It looks like okay. it's been a Christopher. Okay, that's what happened. Probably when I put in Chris, the name, I, I wasn't paying attention and it brought up yours and not his. So, okay. So, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. That's a Board of Building Standards case. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I'm not sure. Hi, this is Susan Steer. No, I know Hello, this is Chris Goble. Oh, hi, Chris. Okay, I see you're in. Yes. Is Dan Hall attending or Rich McNunn? I do not know, but I don't think they're needed. Um, Dan okay. was just for reference if he needed to be here. Okay, okay. Well, then we have everyone here, and Jay Richards with Board of Building Standards will not be present. Okay to a conflict okay all right we'll, we'll, we'll go to that in a second but i just want to get so um i'll just let me do some housekeeping here uh which any Stephen elsass any yes okay so mr elsass is here and then dan miller okay and then who are the other two gentlemen gerald slarman gerald slarman how do you spell that s-c-h l-a-r okay john Minky, and then um, do, do we have uh, either Scott Warren, Warren Matt, or um, Doug Ditto on the phone? Not yet, not till okay. 9.30. Okay. Are they expected? Okay. 
you'll just kind of keep a look for that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, let's go back on the record. Uh, well, I guess we never got off the record, but this is a board building standards uh, matter that's before us. It's case number 21 hyphen zero one three six. Uh, and to the extent that the, the uh, property address is relevant, it's 1101 uh, Beach Road Southwest located in New Albany. Um, and my understanding is we have Mr. Coble, Christopher Coble present, but we do not anticipate Mr. McNunn or Mr. Richards, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Mr. Coble, would you uh, first of all identify yourself by stating your full name, spell your last name, in the capacity by which you're here in a representative way, and then I'll have our court stenographer issue uh, administer an oath and we'll get started. Okay, uh, Christopher Robert Coble, last name C O B L E, and I'm the manufacturer's representative. Fair enough. Okay, if you'd stand wherever you're situated, um, and raise your right hand, please. Okay. You have to swear the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the, the whole truth and nothing but the truth throughout your back. I do. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Coble, you have the floor. Okay, so we are intending to provide um, some mechanical equipment for cooling purposes for the site in New Albany. Um, the chiller hat manufacturer has decided to, to use a, a newer refrigerant, refrigerant that is not currently listed in the 2017 Ohio Mechanical Code. However, by reference, this refer the, the code references ASHRAE 34, um, which has a lot of addendums for that year, and it just so happens this refrigerant was added as an addendum. So I'd like for the board to accept the addendum to the ASHRAE 34 for acceptance of this refrigerant as code. Questions of Mr. Coble? Okay, Yeah, how many of these uh, units are going to be at the location? Uh, currently four with a anticipated future one uh, that there's no current plans to add that addition other than there's footprint for it. So five in total. Actually, if there's no, is there any access into the industrialized units or are they just for uh, equipment only? Uh, there is access and egress path, yes. How big is the unit? I'm sorry, I missed that. How, how big is the unit? Uh, the total footprint of the entire facility is uh, just a little over or just shy of 7,000 square feet. So 7,000 square feet? Correct. For each unit? No, that's for that's for the entire plant. Oh. I meant the, uh, we're dealing with an uh, industrialized unit here. Yes. Whole, I just wanted how big the unit was. Uh, the chiller itself is, um, Hang on, I'll pull up the information. It is uh, 1,420 tons. Um, there's five of them within the plant we're providing, and there are currently it's a multiple section unit. Um, that is trying to find that page. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve different sections that all come back together to form the plant. Any other questions? That answers the question. But yeah. no. Okay. Uh, Assuming no further questions, what are the settlements for them? I don't have any concerns. Yeah, I don't have any concerns that the Board of Building Standards took a look at this, have said that this uh, refrigerant type is going to be um, a recognized standard in the 
upcoming code change. Um, it seems like we're just a little bit ahead of the curve here. Yeah, it's listed at the current and the uh, cash rate. Cash rate. We'll list that. We sent the copy of that. So the building code refers to that. Yeah, but not the new, not the new version of the ash rate standard, right? Well, okay. that's what it said. The Bell portability standards sent us a letter saying that they're going to recognize that new standard in the next code cycle. So, could we do this by? How do we do this? Just help out. How do you state the motion? Can you just grant the variance? Yeah. Is this, I, yeah, I don't, oh, I, don't, go ahead. I don't think it needs to be conditioned on that. Okay, thank you. I would entertain a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for Board of Building Appeals case number 21 0136. Uh, in the penalty to Rich McMunn uh, for the premises 1101 H Road Southwest, New Albany, Ohio 43054. The penalty is Jay Richards, building official. Uh, for the uh, Ohio Board of Building uh, Standards and Adjudication Order Number One, comma IU one nine one three two one seven eight nine. I move to grant the variance, noting no objection of the building official. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> okay, that uh, variance is granted. Thank you very much, Mr. Coble. Thank you. Uh, well, we're a, let me just we're a, we're a kind of a break here because I think we're going to wait for the uh, building official for Allen County. But let me while we're here, let me indicate that uh, case number twenty one item zero one three zero was withdrawn. Uh, I think by communications last evening or relative in the last few days. Um, case number 21-0110 has been continued until December 7th. 21-0120 um, uh, has also been continued to December 7th. And a, an in-person uh, hearing that we have scheduled 21-0087, that also has been continued to December 7th. Um, and then 21 item 0099 uh, has also been continued to, but until uh, November 30th. And then Susan, with respect to the, um, the Mommy fire um, matter where there was the request for extension, you indicated that uh, they, they have asked that this matter be continued and that you gave them a verbal, correct? Correct. Okay. Anybody object to continuance of that based on what you think made Please. Um, Mr. Weinman made the request. Uh, the law director for the city of Long uh, is vacant right now, so yeah, they're trying to get their ducks. The so, uh, gentlemen, any any uh, heartburn over continuing um, 21 hyphen 0047? Okay, so um, no. So, okay, so that'll be continued. I don't think we need to vote on that. Um, okay, um, and then let's just watch to see who we have. If we have anybody from fire or uh, out of county. I'm gonna do a couple of business things. Yeah, we can do that as well. Okay, this is Susan. Um, Mr. Ditto, are you here? Yes. Okay, do you expect the fire um, service to be present? I don't know. Okay. Right, okay, we'll get started in a minute. Yeah, we'll. we'll uh, all right, let's turn it to the. I see we'll be uh, are obliged to approve the minutes of October 25th and October 26th, the last two days that we were in Columbus. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay, Susan. So officially, the minutes for the 25th and 26th of October have been approved. 
suppose we could, uh, we're all here. So the you know, motion to approve uh, compensation for ourselves for our preparation of tenants today. A move, move, is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Steam compensated. And I think we can uh, go on a short recess.
Yeah. Hang on, let me. We did, we did have a public meeting. He's on now. Do you have a letter from Amy? Is it? Oh, no. Okay, without objection, and I'm going to uh, advance a case. Uh, let the record reflect it's 924. In this case is 7 to 930 on our docket. Ellis has not been here for a half hour or so. Ready. I understand that uh, uh, our fire official has tendered a letter saying he'd be available by phone if he was needed. But otherwise, uh, it appears based on our off record conversations that he is not going to uh, attend uh, unless he had to. And um, you have the uh, Allen County um, official that was present by a remote. So let's, let's try this. Record reflects calling case number 21 Um and this deals with uh, uh, the premises located known as D and D Creek Distributors located in Delphus and uh, the Lima slash Allen County Building Authority adjudication number is noted on the docket. Um, I took down the names of the individuals that are present for the talents. Let's start with Mr. L. Sass. Spell your uh, state your real name, spell your last name, ask the way which you're here. We'll do the same thing with Mr. Miller, Room 31, and Mr. Mason. And I'll ask Mr. Kidd. Steve Nelsas, L S A S S, advisor manager. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I said, I'm just going to see you situated there. I got you. Thanks. Dan Miller, the S I L L E R. Miller, the Bill Swallow, S C H I R. Thank you. Don Minky, N E N K P, A one, Sprinkler and Systems Integration. Okay, Mr. Ditto. Uh, Douglas Ditto, Assistant Building Administrator, Lime Island County Building Department, Ditto, D I T T O. Hang with us, Mr. Ditto. You were faint, so we're going to try to. Uh, Get you to be more clear audibly. If there's a volume control on yours, maybe that'll help as well. All right, let's try that. Okay, Mr. Ditto, if you would stand here. Okay. Yeah. He's not I, you guys are breaking up. I'm going to swear you in, Mr. Ditto. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be back. I do. I do. Okay, great. I do. Mr. All right, Mr. Elsass or others. Well, I'd like to just make sure you guys did receive all the packets that I had sent to Susan, uh, the letters from Fire Chief, Acting Fire Chief, our design engineer, preferred design, um, as letters. As well from A1 and Ceasefire, who is the manufacturer of the system that's being. We do have that pack.
This is Doug. Did I have audio again? I just back on. Can you hear us? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Let's. let's all right. We, we're gonna we're gonna um, come back on the record, Tammy, um, Mr. Ditto. We we think we lost you, um, uh, or at least we we lost you in an audible way. Um, all I had done thus far uh, was. Uh, 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 had asked the appellant uh, uh, to begin by giving uh, a few remarks. And when he was done, I asked if you were present and if you were not, or at least you couldn't hear. So Mr. Yelts asked, which can, can I ask you? To, you know, we do have the packet, okay. but beyond that, you, you had some other comments. Yeah. On that. Uh, basically, the reason we're here is uh, for, the, for the benefit of D&D Green is our uh, customer. Constructing a warehouse board, um, and with the packet that was sent to you, um, we were would like to be granted a variance to a the smoke and heat relief system due to the nature of what's being stored. And I can let Dan explain the company side as far as what these ingredients are. That's that's fine. And that's fine. And then we may have some questions for uh, more for it. Maybe yeah. as part of your presentation. You need to understand um, really what the hardship is. You can understand that you don't want to install it, and you have reasons why you don't want to install it. But what are the cost implications um, for installing it, and the reason why you, you, you don't want to? Um, just as, as part of your presentation, sure. just so that they'll see if it's asking those questions at yeah. the end. Sure. I, I think you can uh, speak to the cost portion of it. Yeah, we're talking. I don't have any hard numbers, but just budget numbers we came up with. You're looking at $100,000 to put a heat relief system into this building. And in the process of doing that, Ceasefire, who is the manufacturer of the dry chemical system, has stated their concerns with if that system would be put into action, but them having heat um, sensed activated pendants. It's going to affect their system working properly because now you're reducing air, cooler air to get out to get the smoke and heat out, and they are very concerned. Mm -hmm. Max, uh, yes, yes, you may, <clears throat> please. John Minky with A1. Uh, of the system, we've got over 16,000 pounds of dry chemical in the system in the tanks that are hanging. We've got them in the rows and in on over top of the uh, stack shelving. Each one of these canisters has a fusible uh, link in it at 155 degrees. It releases and it throws out an umbrella of suppression uh, power. And it's 15 by 15, and that's why it's lined up the way it is. If we were to put the smoke and heat removal system in, and they go off individually. You know, it's not like in the movies. They go off individually as they're activated. If we did have a some kind of flash fire, which I don't know how it happened, but if it did, if it set off two or three of these tanks, the fire suppression would be defeated because automatically when the tank would go off, the heat and smoke removal would come on. And instead of my suppression coming down, it would get drawn outside. So now I have no suppression to the building, and that's why we laid out the suppression as they required and as we did. And my drawings have already been uh, approved for the suppression system, but the heat and smoke removal would defeat what we've got already approved. How is that any different than any other sprinkler system? Um, yeah. How it works? How is that any different than any other sprinkler system and how it right. works? Sprinkler system, I've got water, and water is going to can come down. It's, it's heavy. I understand, but they are operated by a fusible link in the exact same manner that your system is. Is that incorrect? So I'm not a sprinkler. I work for a sprinkler company, but so I'm on, this, on the, that side. The, the issue isn't. The issue is the fact that the water is heavier than the, the sprinkler the power, powder, correct. and uh, a smoke removal system draw out the powder 
fire retardant material or suppression material will draw it out through the exhaust vents. Correct. Whereas the, because the water is heavier, it won't draw out the water. So basically, if you have this heat and smoke removal system, you're effectively sucking out the heat, the smoke, and the fire retardant material. Yes, sir. As far as D&D's portion, um, so we're going to have different uh, feed ingredients and completed feed blends. Um, I believe they passed along with a list of potential uh, bottles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, our products are not flammable. Um, you know, at best, they may smolder. Um, primary would be primary areas that's flammable are the wooden pallets that they're sitting on. And then, uh, um, you know, they're either in a plastic uh, tote or bagged in a simple paper bag. Um, limited flammability and the fact the Primary ingredient in these systems is monosodium phosphate to the ingredient we also carry. Um, you know, you know, um, the reason for the system is being proposed and approved for fire suppression is to protect his feed ingredients from any damage by water. That water system. Very detrimental to in their product. In regards to that, I mean, if one of those dry chemical plants went off, you're throwing all that product out anyhow, are you not? No. Um, in fact, uh, this system is used in different food uh, facilities. Uh, so basically, the powder can be, you know, removed from the product, and it's a completely resellable form. Uh, you know, everything is packaged already. Um, suppressant. You know, not toxic or anything like that. So. Is it food grade? Um, inside. I mean, I guess this isn't food material. So right. I, a lot of the companies we deal with consider their stuff food grade, but. Um, All right, just just a timeout. Mr. Ditto, are you still with us? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I believe the letter that we have from the fire chief, uh, you know, who's familiar with our facilities and our products, uh, indicated he does not feel it's uh, fired and in fact, I believe he kind of spoke up about putting the uh, he does. firefighters at greater risk, you know, by introducing additional oxygen to the fire. Uh, that's for the tractor fires. I guess I, guess I have a question. Maybe it's part of the chip about the whole venting system. And they came up with a no, I need to put chip under a when. <laughs> I mean, I want to respond to his, his comment. I was looking at the commentary and why do they provide venting? And then in chief, his letter talked talked about a draft created. I guess that the best open up, close it open, introduce more oxygen, it makes the fire worse. And uh, it, you know, the commentary says something about the primary purpose of smoke and heat removal from a building. The code requirement is to assist fire fighting operations after control of the fire to get rid of the smoke building. And in this case, this chemical that they're using, the um, fire marshal said the need to evacuate immediately to do the adverse effects of the chemical. So it seems like it'd be a good okay. thing to clear this building out if that chemical goes off after the fire is out because it's full of smoke. How do you get the smoke and the chemical out of there? The chemical, to, or, uh, the chemical, I would imagine, would, would settle, you know, the particles would settle down. Uh, in essence, you, you get rid of it two ways. 
to open the door and whatever's not on the ground, the air moves, moves it out. And literally you're just brushing off the bags and the totes and you sweep it up. It's like a fire, it's like a, a fire extinguisher on steroids is what it is. So here we have a situation where I can answer for that question. The problem is if you the sprinkler, the sprinkler system is either going to put the fire out initially or it's not. But the, the issue then becomes if you have if it doesn't and then you reintroduce or open up these smoke vents and heat vents, then you're bringing in oxygen. This is going to feed the fire and make it worse. But you get open. I mean, I guess the vents can be operated manually. You know, they, they all are. None of them are automatic. So they're all automatic. You know, they're all, all manual by the fire department. Typically, they're, they're tied into the fire alarm system. They don't have to be. Or you, they have right. a link to yeah, hold, that, hold, hold that comment for a second. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Welch, he's a fire official, but he's also a lawyer. He's got a short over here. We're going to see how long it's going to be. Um, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll see whether or not. Uh, the parties are comfortable proceeding from four to four um, in light of maybe some of the sentiments you've already explicitly heard from Mr. Welch. So, Mr. Ditto, can you hear us still? Yes. Okay, we're going to take just a very short recess, but we may come back on uh, and see if we can proceed in front of four while we're uh, we're down one of our board members. So let's go off the record. Okay. Please.
Well, you're not. He's <laughs> yeah. I'm uh-huh. guardian ad litem, so I don't know. A lot of lines so I'll put that on. I think we'll put Okay, um, Mr. Jitta, you still there? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, Tammy, let's go back on the record. Yeah. Uh, Brad, Chip, Mr. Hank, you have a question for the appellant this time? Uh, yeah, so I, I do, I'm sure Mr. Ditto will have something to say to this as well, but you know, we do have um, this issue about the UO uh, approval that system specifically since the, the UL listing is for and not for your system. Can you address that in some, some manner? That's been changed. That was uh, something that CSPIRE had sent to Amy yep. and we sent several letters. I know Steve sent several letters to her saying that was a suggestion on the sprinkler head, but they're going with the approved sprinkler head that we have our permit for. That's a good response. Not a quick response. It's not a good 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 response. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So that's covering the whole area, even not the rack storage. Is that the accurate? Yes. Yes. The rack or is it storage it? in the open floor space? I've got a larger drawing if you want to see that. I see where you had. So from here to here is not rack storage. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. Five okay. Sections, right. That's loaded out. So I guess more so my question, and I don't know if you guys could even answer it, is. What's the combustion rate on these canisters that are up there? If you don't have a ventilation system in there and it gets up to, you know, 150 degrees up there with the pressurized canisters all hanging from the ceiling, it's from what I read, they're all hanging from the ceiling. Is that accurate? Right. Is, right. Uh, is there a concern a tow motor catches on fire in that open space and is not extinguished with one canister? I've I worked on sprinkler systems, but water sprinkler where it keeps coming, so I understand that. Right. But the whole and a chemical thing, I know it's just one shot, right? That one canister, yes, sir. But that, that covers a 15 by 15 area. Okay. If I have a tow motor on fire, it hits the first one, it goes off, and it drops its powder. Okay. I still have on all four sides, if the fire was to extend, it's going to hit. Through you know stratification is going to set off more and more and more as it grows. So in essence, you do have until those are empty, of course. But right on a tow motor, using one thing it usually goes is the propane tank, and there are fire extinguishers in the in the room also. So I've got high and middle protection for that. But That's so cool. for the rack storage part, you're going to drop a head on above every. Just as those circles show, that's there's 324 canisters in that building. It's over 16,000 pounds of dry chemical. And these are accessible to inspect. Absolutely. All yes, sir. That's how we laid them out. So you're 40 down, inches down. down. I'm sorry. You're 40 inches in between your racks, I believe. Whatever it was. That sounded something like that. Yeah. that is I thought it said you were 75 inches. inches. Oh, it's 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 the aisles are 75 inches wide. Your racks are 104 back to back, full of width. I thought they were for something. They might be. All right, well, let's, let's do this. Mr. Ditto. Uh, Let's hear from uh, the building department. So, um, 
I assume everyone's read the letter that Amy Amy sent. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Um, like they um, have, have expressed, there were multiple letters back and forth uh, trying to to get a quick response, but there was um, but there was some issues where those heads weren't rated for dry chemical um, and there was no UL approval for the system uh, based on that. Um, our stance is that the code requires the, the heat and smoke removal and we would like to see that installed in the building. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Dingo, you're a little bit closer to it. Is that uh, smoke and heat uh, system is an automatic system or is it a manual system operated by the fire department? Uh, the code. Let me let me look it up real quick. I think it. I think it was supposed to be automatic. It does not say that it has to be automatic. It just says it has it shall be installed. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Ditto? Any other questions uh, of the appellants? I'm hearing uh, what uh, what what are the thoughts uh, of the members of the board? Well, we do have an odd uh, situation that the building department is not supportive of variance and the uh, fire official is. Right. I think they could have gotten together to talk a little bit more. Um, okay. My opinion, I think a manual smoke system is not a bad idea. It gives flexibility for the fire department, if they need to get smoke out. Let me ask a question. How 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 tall is the, the building? 33 to the east. Yeah, 33 feet. I mean, I understand that most of your product is, is not combustible. But the, the best thing, if there is, and it gets filled up with smoke, now it does make it difficult to any search and rescue and things like that, you'll have an option to be able to get that smoke out if they want to. Um, I just they fully understand the operation of your system. And they want to stay on and operational. You know, I mean, it, 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 I don't see any reason not to do it if it was a manual system controlled by the fire department. What's the overall cost of the project? Between three, two, three, two, three, three, two and three million, three point three million. Okay. I definitely would not support an automatic smoke and heat removal system. I, I think that is potentially a recipe for disaster. Chairman, I yeah, go ahead, Mr. Neto. Yeah, I I just found um, nine ten or nine ten point four point four activation. It says it shall be my by manual controls only. Okay. I guess I just put a here on the answering this question. How does that is that is is a heat smoke removal system going to be effective in a racked building or a building 
full of rack storage. Yeah, I don't see why, why not. Because really the I understand it's the same lot of data that comes into this. Probably. There is a fire and that smoke goes up there and I can't get out of that smoke and the air can go right. down, you know, 33 feet is a long time ago. So at some some point in time, or, you know, there, there is a way to go and calculate over time uh, a fire to find out when that's going to be done. I don't know that. But it also it wouldn't. To me, it just says, all right, it can do no harm if the fire department doesn't open. True. Right. But they need to. They don't have that option. That, that, that's just me thinking practically about it. I know it's an expense. I would support the city. Russell, you would support the suppression system. I would support. Well, I mean, I support the suppression system. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense for their product. I would support the main heat and smoke groups. Is I mean, your involvement in construction daily it sounds like. Is it not kind of practice to have the, the, the for smoke removal to have the louvers at the highest point in the soffits? I mean, you know, if there's a gable nice. roof on each end of the gable, and that way you're drawing the air from up top and you're not creating a chimney. Right. I mean, until the firemen put their hose through the door and leave the door open, then yes, then it's time to shut down the, you know, stop the draft. Stop the draft. Yeah. yeah, I would I would just say that the smoke control is just manually operated. There is something. Uh, yeah. When it comes to ventilation, there is already a proof ventilation system in this building for occupant for occupant load. Um, fresh air in makes a lot of difference. Right, it's got yeah, but rain, the, first, right? the but first thing that happens is the fire department turns off the power. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, you're right. I completely agree. Yeah. All right, Brad. Yeah, no, I mean, it's not that. Yeah, no. Elementary, I, I read. He so. <laughs> sounds like a journey. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Which is it? <laughs> we, we don't need another one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know how cold the map Okay, I, I would, I would as well. Um, Not if we're Unless, unless for some reason we want to give the fire department, the building department, and the applicant okay. an opportunity to sit down and talk. I mean, because you're right, they're not all three on the same page. Right. I mean, if you know, I think if you were retooling, so if. if the local fire jurisdiction would really oppose to this. They'd be here, and their letter was obviously indicated support of it. So what we're pontificating up here is if we just set this down for a couple week or a thirty day continuance to allow the CEO, the fire official, and whatever opposition of view is. See if you become symptomatic of one. Right now, when you look at it, looks like the adjudication for this harvester, this potato, is going to be it's going to be affirmed, and you're not going to get a variance. What, what think about? Well, maybe it's a question, Mr. Ditto. Do you think, Mr. Ditto, that there is any uh, circumstances uh, by which further uh, discussions? With the appellant and the, the local fire official, that the Miss Harpster and or yourself would would change your position. Uh, I mean, I I haven't seen anything that that supports not putting it in. You know, I I know it's there for a reason, and it's it. 
I, I've been through the commentary on the code uh, along with, with Amy, and we, we haven't seen a valid reason not to have the heat and smoke removal as a part of this project. How, how often does, I mean, I know you got different fire jurisdictions in your pretty big building department, uh, geographic uh, jurisdictional base, but how, how often or close do you work with this fire department? Uh, not a lot since they've had a change in administration. And actually, I think Mr. Warnema is uh, he's acting. He's an appointed, yeah, acting fire chief at this point. Um, and we've not had very much communication with him as of yet on this. All right, so Paul, what's that do for you? He's on that question. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'll, I'll, if, if, if my colleagues want to uh, pull the adjudication order out, I'll, I'll stand in the way of that. But if we're inclined to uh, kick this out of ways to let the parties get together, I'll, I'll look at that as well. I guess I'll just go along for the ride here. I mean, I, 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 I'd be in favor of what we're Mr. Ditto's point, right there, there's a reason for it. Fact that he went through and did some research while we we're during the hearing to see that it is a manual system only that gives the option to the point. I think this is yeah, I'd still uphold the adjudication rather than based on well. I mean, if they if they want to continue it, I'll support a continuance. I'm not opposed to that. They're just <laughs>
Hey, Mr. Ditto, are you still there? Yes. Okay, fair enough. Gentlemen, what, what, is, what, what do you want to do? Um, I'd like to have John Menke's go. Okay. A couple points that he explained to us out in the hallway. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, initially, if we're talking about the air movement in the building, okay. First of all, this building is totally in, uh, has a total fire alarm system. I have audio visits, horns, and strobes throughout. First head goes off, I'm evacuating that building. The maximum I have 12 or 13 people. They're out with me. Second of all, I also had 34 years of the fire department covering as a lieutenant. The first thing you don't you don't do is pull the electric. First thing you do is you call DPNO, AEC, power and light and gas for them to come out. I am fighting that fire. Okay. If the door, garage doors go up, I'm not feeding that fire. I'm evacuating smoke because at 33 feet or 30 feet. As the smoke starts to stratify down, it's going to be leaving the building in through those overhead doors. How many overhead doors we have? Four. Four. So I got plenty of air movement moving the smoke out of there. Um, being on an engine crew, that's the first thing you do. You go in, you fight the fire, you open up so that I have my firefighters in cleaner air than fire. I don't want that set up to bank that. Which is correct, but overhead doors are wonderful places to evacuate air. I've got air movement on the sides of the building, as Steve has explained. I got air moving out of that building. I just think it's uh, the thought that this smoke and heat removal system, I truthfully, in my opinion, 34 years in the fire department. And 36 years in the alarm and suppression system believe that it is something that would be detrimental to the action system that's been approved for the suppression of this. Thank you. Okay, good. Any questions, Mr. Mankey, on that? I mean, that seems like a, obviously an, an argument that's being tendered to. Why is it detrimental uh, again? I'm sorry. Why is it detrimental again? Because I'm reviewing if I have that in there and they turn the fans on. If they keep the manually operated after fires out. Okay, and if it fires out, my smoke's going to cool down, get low enough, it's going to escape out the, out the building in. Well, ventilation, you can do vertical or horizontal ventilation. Very easily done, sir. Because once the fire's out, the electricity can be you know, turned back on. Um, the ventilation system is part of the system. Okay, well, um, is that, do you find that compelling enough to reconsider the position? Let me, let me before I ask the, my colleague, Mr. Ditto, uh, was that compelling in your mind, or is the building department's position what the building department's position is? If, if the smoke can, and the heat can readily be removed through the Side openings. Um, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if the ceasefire canisters have a uh, a point where they could overheat and burst, but um, you know, because those are all high, and the heat from the fire, if there was a fire, is all going to go up where those canisters are are staged. So. Um, I guess that's a question for ceasefire. That would have, that would trigger the sprinkler heads on each unit. Um, at that point, then you know that pressure from within the tank has been relieved. It's a pressure release valve. Is what it well, I guess maybe the question here is: Is there more of a basis to continue this to allow the parties to huddle, or uh, are we where we were? I'm not for Mr. Chair. I mean, I understand that. 
it's it's a system. It doesn't have to be activated. If the fire department thinks the best way to do it is to not utilize it. It's just it's a, it's a it's a it's a required system. It's an extra tool that gives the fire department uh, flexibility to be able to do what they think is right at the moment. That does not change my opinion. I just don't uphold the adjudication. Yeah, I'm half wicked. It's not that it's an alternate. We have been. Sounds like the building official. Sounds like sounds like you're party. Yes, probably I am. Okay. Well, um, doesn't look like you want to saw me continue, but I would entertain a motion. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, from the Board of Building Appeals, case number two one zero zero one two seven, the appellant is D and D and Green uh, Distributors. Uh, for the premises D and D Green green distributors warehouse at 5191 North Kill Road, Delphos, Ohio 405833. The appellees aren't Amy Harpster, building official for the Lima Allen County Building Department and adjudication order number 2021 uh, I move to uphold uh, the adjudication order. Okay, that motion has been moved. Second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Um, all right, by a four to one vote, um, I'm, 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 I, I voted to affirm by a four to one vote the uh, adjudication orders upheld. Hopefully, you can still maybe revisit this issue with Ms. Harpster, Mr. Pitto, uh, and the acting chief, come up with an alternative or something that maybe persuades us. Of Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, that would conclude our active docket. I think I mentioned every case. Uh, uh, compensated ourselves, taking an action to do so, taking an action to uh, our board minutes for the last two days of hearings. Um, Tammy, thank you for being here. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, subject to uh, um, our next meeting, which I have to announce on the record, so I think I do, is November 29th, so Monday, 2021, 12th, we'll be in Reynoldsburg. Um, uh, we have given Susan uh, the okay to check out the Worcester uh, OSU Ag facility. Um, and if it meets for her satisfaction, go ahead and convert the December 7th meeting to Worcester. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in uh, favor? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Or we stand adjourned. Thank you. So you live, you, you live where you live? I live south of Norwalk, so from here.